Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and my co-host Katie is only with us in spirit and pre-recorded audio because of the damn pandemic. She most likely has COVID, we're still waiting to find out for sure, but she's not feeling great. It's not even sexy voice great, it is just plain awful. And we wish her a speedy recovery. But to help me with this episode, I'm joined by several of our wonderful patrons. Wahoo! I tried to do the Katie thing. <laughs> um, it is Carly, the support badger here. Hi, it's Quincy, all around good guy, amazing person, you know, me. <laughs> Hi, it's Max, the resident Brit. Hi, it's Jackson, the thunder from down under. The Australian patron. <laughs> Love it. Love um, it. Sarah, I like to write, not talk, but here we are because no one can say no to Ellen. I do not take no for an answer. And you know what? I love you all for it. Thank you so much for helping me with this. It would have been really boring for me to have to do this by myself. For now, we're just going to keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week, we covered the second half of the final chapter of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, chapter 37, the beginning, and the somewhat corresponding film scenes. Another year at Hogwarts has ended, much to Harry's dismay. Everyone says their goodbyes. The Golden Trio watch as the Bobaton and Durmstrang students begin their journeys home, and we come to an end of the fourth story. Unless you are reading the book, in which case, it's not over yet. We see their journey home, where Hermione finally gets to tell her besties about the jarring month Rita has had that will prevent her from writing shit about Harry. Draco, Crabbe, and Goyle get an extreme makeover via some blended jinxes from the trio and the Weasley twins. Fred and George finally admit they were blackmailing Ludo Bagman for stealing their life savings, and Harry is again a hero when he secretly forces them to take his Quad Wizard Cup winnings for their joke shop. Everyone says their goodbyes, and Harry follows his uncle out of the train station, deciding there is no point in worrying yet. What will come will come, and he will meet it when it does. And now, we are actually at the end of the fourth story. The lack thereof. (laughs) Yeah. Corresponding film scenes. Yeah. I agree. The very, very bare minimal of corresponding film scenes. They tried. Yeah. During episode 114, Beta Beetle Rita, our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts on how the movie wrapped up Goblet of Fire? It's kind of fun that we have some of the people who send in ponderings live right now, but you're still going to get to hear their recordings. Hey, Ellen. Hey, Katie. Hey, Keepers. How we doing? This is Jackson with my final Potter pondering for Goblet of Fire. Yay! (laughs) So, how do I feel about how the Goblet of Fire movie was wrapped up? For the movie version, okay. But I'm still going to rant. You know I'm still going to (laughs) rant. So, yeah, the movie version did not do the book's ending justice at all. No capture of Rita Skeeter. No reveal of how she got her stories. But then again, all her stories weren't in the movie anyway. Yet another stupid decision. No multiple spells cast on Malfoy, Crabbe and Doyle. Oh, we were built. We were built out of that. And no Harry giving his Triwizard winnings away. I mean, what... How do you have Fred and George operating a joke shop in two movies and not have it known exactly how they started up, where they got the money? I mean, what the hell? Ugh. I can't deal with that. No. 
Thank God it's the last time I get to say that. <laughs> Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering of Depression. And excitement because we are finally finished with a goblet of fire. Woo! It was a wonderful journey, you guys, but here we are. Here we are with the movie ending with Harry and Ron's, you know, little convo. Harry's like, man, that was a fucked up year, bro. And Ron injects his light humor here. And then Hermione's like, no, you guys, this shit just got real. And scene. You know why? Because the last bit of plot twist we're ironing out in the end of this didn't even exist in the movies. But it's cool, you know. We don't have to get into Rita Skeeter again because... You know, that shit's been pissing me off this entire time. So you guys already know how I feel about that. It definitely would have been cool to see that nice little tussle in the train compartment. You know, jinxing and hexing the fuck out of Malfoy and his cronies. And then, you know, kind of awkwardly stepping over and on them to get out of the compartment. Like, tell me you guys wouldn't want to see that. Everybody wanted to see that shit. Just, oh. And then, my favorite part is Harry giving the twins the cash. It literally shows so much about Harry's character. He's the fucking insufferable good guy. Like, I don't want these fucking blood funds. And I honestly think if he wasn't able to give that shit away, he would have yeeted it out the window. And Ron would have been like, the fuck? But Harry could not take it. I felt like it was literally burning a hole in his pocket. And not because he was spending it. Because it was literally torturing him to have it. And Fred and George are like, I don't give a fuck about blood money, life money, death money, Voli's money. Give me the cash. Are you sure, my boy? Because oh, I will flip this. Like Gucci Man wife did when he was in prison. I will flip this. You sure, Potter? You sure? They <laughs> they took it with no regret. That you can tell that Fred and George don't give a fuck about a shady transaction or two. But look what they did with their life savings. Oh, oh, you didn't read the book, so you don't know what I'm talking about. That's cool. You know, let's just end this on a light note because I know if you listen to this podcast, you think I hate the movies. Which isn't the case. I'm just deeply passionate about my ponderings, okay? I love Harry Potter in the movie so much that I cannot even remember what my personal imagination was when I read the books. I will forever see Harry as Dan, Hermione as Emma, and Ron as Rupert. And I don't remember what I thought they were because the movies were so good. The best screen adaptation of a book I've ever seen in my life and I've read a lot and I've watched a lot and nothing else has injected my imagination with their image because it's usually trash it's just that Ellen and Katie have ignited a fire in my soul that I didn't know existed I did not know that I had this passion to comb through every film scene in every book chapter with a fine tooth comb and it is so fun you guys you should try it oh my gosh happy new year to all of the keepers ellen and katie thank you for making this podcast i'm having so much fun keep up the good work you guys hello there it is the support dadger calling in for once i have something nice to say about noor and his nonsense but I really like the ending of this movie. It felt really heartwarming and nice to have that kind of moment where Hermione's like, everything's going to change now, isn't it? And Harry's real serious and he puts his hand on her shoulder and says, yeah. I think that's a very Potter thing to say. Like, all right, Harry knows. But in one of the books, I think it's five, he says, man, I wonder what it'd be like to have a normal life. Well, that's a very Potter thing to say. Anyways, the end was very wholesome and kind of like such a nice, 
happy, sad ending to the movie because of all the stuff that they went through and Cedric dying and all that. I feel like they had a good, happy, sad moment. So for the first time in a while, I have something positive to say. And that's what it is. So good endings, good ridden. And thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, in the U.S. version, Mrs. Weasley serves homemade strawberry ice cream for dessert. What do they refer to dessert as in the U.K. version? The U.K. version refers to desserts as puddings. I've never, ever seen something written as pudding unless for Christmas puddings. So that's a little interesting fact for you there. Huh. Or it might just be because I grew up really posh. So Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. But congratulations goes to Carly Ferguson, who is with us today. Woohoo! I won. I'm very excited about it. I got my birthday episode trivia question. Woohoo! You're so cute. That was a wonderful woohoo. I don't know if it quite fills Katie's shoes. Definitely doesn't fill her bra. <laughs> <laughs> Not wrong. <laughs> but she's got a damn good wahoo and really good wahoos. So. <laughs> You're definitely not wrong. You're definitely not wrong. <laughs> See, these are the perks of being a patron. Anyway, let's just keep rolling into the differences between the UK and US versions of the book and our favorite moments discussing Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Chapter 1, The Riddle House. There's a description of the windows by the door of the Riddle House, and in the UK version, it says windows either side of the door. And in the U.S. version, it's windows on either side of the door. So in this case, Americans just really want that extra letter. We like prepositions. We sure do. And propositions. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> there is also if I curse versus if I murder. In the U.K. version, Wormtail is trying to talk Voldemort out of using Harry for his rebirth. And he uses the term curse in the U.K. version, but murder in the American version, which is a little bit more drastic, I think. Murder seems a little bit more serious. It's very on the nose, isn't it? <laughs> serious. <laughs> <laughs> if I expel or if I murder. Yeah. I kind of wish I had read the British versions now. I don't know. Because uh, I like the more dramatic flair of it. As they go on, they get significantly less Americanized, and we're going to find less of these differences. But chapter one had a few because this conversation between Voldemort and Wormtail kept going and Voldemort responded saying it's one more obstacle removed in the UK version. But he just says one more death in the American version. So it's kind of a little bit more dramatic, like maybe not dramatic. It's kind of a little bit more direct. He's just blatantly talking about murdering, killing people in the American version. And they're a little bit more subtle about it in the UK version. I was going to actually point out that it sounds they're, like they're talking more about an object instead of a person, which is- That very, is a really interesting perspective. Very Voldemort-esque. People are not people there. Right. Maybe it's about how they're viewing the murder as the bad thing in the US, but in the UK, they're viewing the obstacle as the bad thing. Yeah. And Voldemort does continue on to again say one more curse in the UK version versus one more murder in the American version. So it's all kind of the same thing with the differences in that exchange, but it is notable. It's really interesting. I think Voldemort sounds more detached from people. Like if I don't use pronoun here, or if I say, you know, I'm just one more curse, that doesn't sound like murder. But in the American version, they're like, ah, murder, murder. It seems almost more subconscious, though, because I think he just is detached. Mm -hmm. He is. But now for our favorite moments from the episode covering chapter one. It's kind of interesting to think how the killing curse must work then, if it doesn't leave any obvious traces. Bam! Magic! Bam! Dead! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plus, in the book, he got to hear words like Quidditch, Ministry of Magic, Wizards, and Muggles. I'd probably hang around and listen in, too. So, I mean, then I'm just thinking it's crackheads. Like, <laughs> or somebody who's just high off their nut. 
Then I'm especially running, dude. Right, but it's like a train wreck. Nah. You can't look away. I, if they're crackheads? Oh. I don't know. I'm out. Cheaper than cable. <laughs> So now we're on to chapter two and chapter three. So chapter two was the scar and chapter three was the invitation. There aren't any differences for either of these chapters and they combine them for the episode since there weren't any corresponding film scenes, which is very disappointing. So we will go right into our favorite moments. I'm always intrigued when people are like, what Harry Potter movie should I start with? And I'm like, "Uh, the first one? Why, Why would you... Is that a question? Yeah. Oh, that's a question. I've gotten that question. I've told people, watch the first three movies. Yeah. Read the last four books. Yeah. If you're not going to read all of them. Yeah. However, I also tell people to read all of them. <laughs> Just you? <laughs> Just read them all. All of the times. <laughs> Need to read Ikea instructions? Don't. Read Harry Potter instead. Yes. If you have to read, read Harry Potter. (laughs) If you have to read, read Harry Potter. My new slogan. (laughs) Of course, I would love for every single literal word to have been somehow included. Oh, no, you gave me more Harry Potter. No. How dare you, you... You monster. (laughs) You muggle fucker. (laughs) Muffucker. (laughs) Muffucker. Sorry. (laughs) Chapter four, Back to the Barrel. There also aren't any differences, but we combined this chapter with chapter five. So we'll talk about those before we go into our favorite moments. In chapter five, Weasley's Wizard Wheezes, we have a difference here with Bulgaria have got versus Bulgaria has got, which is what Fred points out to Charlie when they and George are discussing who will win the Quidditch World Cup. Yeah, Bulgaria have got victor crumb in the uk version and has got victor crumb in the u.s version no one has such a good grasp of english that they would know who had said the right thing here (laughs) yeah that definitely seems like a lot of having to go through and edit that little piece like why why would you take that time i would not like is bulgaria a thing or are bulgaria things i don't know how to say that direct object of the sentence versus the subject of the sentence, I assume. I'm rewriting all the books from Hermione's perspective. And a lot of the times when I take sections of the book, not even dialogue, but actual sentences of the book and put them in, it pops up in Grammarly, which tells me that it is the wrong grammar. I have it switched to the British version. So even the British version of Grammarly says this is not proper grammar. So... Yeah, And you know what? Mistakes happen. I did notice it in my UK version that my friend picked up for me when he was in Scotland. So it was there. Maybe it was a mistake. Maybe not. Yeah. This is kind of a wording difference. What happened, said Harry eagerly, regretting more than ever his isolation from the wizarding world when he was stuck on the drive. Harry was passionate about Quidditch. He had played a seeker on the Gryffindor House Quidditch team ever since his first year at Hogwarts and owned a Firebolt one of the best racing brooms in the world. Went down to Transylvania, 390 to 10, said Charlie gloomily. Shocking performance, and Wales lost to Uganda, and Scotland was slaughtered by Luxembourg, versus, what happened, said Harry eagerly, regretting more than ever his isolation from the wizarding world when he was stuck on Privet Drive. Went down to Transylvania, 390 to 10, said Charlie gloomily. Shocking performance, and Wales lost to Uganda, and Scotland was slaughtered by Luxembourg. Harry had been on the Gryffindor House Quidditch team ever since his first year at Hogwarts and owned one of the best racing grooms in the world, a Firebolt. Flying came more naturally to Harry than anything else in the magical world, and he played in the position of seeker on the Gryffindor House team. It's interesting because it got a lot of the same information across, and I don't really see the point in switching it. It's like they just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just for it. Yeah, I agree that, what was the point of that? They like making extra work for themselves, I assume. Maybe they had like an actual quota of differences they had to find to justify a reprinting. Maybe. And maybe it was just to give you more to read, Max. (laughs) Yeah. Their foresight. Another difference in the chapter is they had their pudding, homemade strawberry ice cream, of course, versus they had their homemade strawberry ice cream. 
so the difference here is the dessert pudding after dinner in the garden with the Weedleys. Which was also our trivia question. And now, here are our favorite moments from the episode covering chapters four and five. Like, okay, so take in Sorcerer's Stone, Philosopher's Stone, the moment where Dudley realizes he has a pig's tail. Look at Harry Melling's face in that, and then just imagine that face with a foot-long tongue coming out of it. Up to a four-foot-long tongue. Yes, exactly, up to four feet. There's no way you don't laugh at that. Go on. Been hysterical. Ugh. Oh, my stars. I can't oh. believe they left that out. Oh, my stars. It's a crime. I tell you, a it's crime. a crime. Well, I never. <laughs> Fred insists that he didn't give him anything. He dropped it, and it was Dudley's fault that he ate it. He never told him to. My stars. I just dropped it. He I ate it. I just dropped it. Oh, that poor boy. (laughs) I never meant for that to happen. Oh, no. Ginny probably thought it was a girl. A girl. It was like green-eyed Ginny just being like, wait, what? Yeah. What'd you say? Who who did you hear from? Who's this bitch? Who do I need to use the bat bogey hex on? (laughs) I'll cut a bitch. Don't make me cut a bitch. I will cut a bitch. What bitch am I cutting? I will hit her over the head with a broomstick. (laughs) Here we have chapter six, the port key. We start off with, Harry knew that apparating was very difficult and meant disappearing from one place and reappearing almost instantly in another. Versus, Harry knew that apparating meant disappearing from one place and reappearing almost instantly in another, but had never known any Hogwarts student to do it and understood that it was very difficult. So this is really just another swap things around difference. Yeah, I don't know the point of it. Same information, slightly different order. Yeah, absolutely same information. Our second difference in Chapter 6 was got your test versus passed your test, referring to apparating. Mrs. Weasley snaps, you haven't got your test yet, versus passed your test yet, in response to Fred wanting to know why they can't apparate to the Quidditch World Cup like Bill, Charlie, and Percy. This was actually an interesting one because here in Australia, we say pass your test. We don't say got your test like the UK. Does that sound right to you, Max? No, it's definitely passed your test. No one says got your test here. Interesting change then. I think she who must not be named might be showing her age with that one. <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> and now here are our favourite moments from their discussion of Chapter 6. And the corresponding film scenes. Rude! You know what else is rude? Hmm? Harry's hair. Oh, God. Harry's hair is a crime against hair follicles. Like, it kills me how bad it is. They should charge him with follicular manslaughter. Oh, my God. (laughs) I I set you up for that, didn't I? Uh (laughs) Shit. Wow. Bump set spike! (laughs) Uh, way to go, Maverick. <laughs> Thanks, Goose. <laughs> but while we're on this scene, though, I also don't like how Ron covers himself like he's a fucking scandalized Southern Belle and Hermione is an unexpected man in her chambers. How dare you, sir? Oh, my stars. <laughs> oh, goodness. A man. I'm scandalized. Harry asks what a portkey is, and no one bothers to answer him, because why would you do that? Why? Why would you help out the person who's never seen a portkey before? That's just silly. (laughs) I mean, they're way too busy with their manky old boots. I mean, exactly. Everyone is down on their hands and their knees, getting busy with the boot. Wait, no. (laughs) Not that. The... They all just have a hand on the boot. I touch the boot. That's not helping, Ellen. (laughs) Chapter 7, Bagman and Crouch. Once again... No differences. Woohoo! But here are our favorite moments. That kind of didn't make sense to me, though. Like, they know what numbers are. Right. The numbers are right on the bills, but whatever. It makes it funny. It, did, for, it was funny. Sure. It didn't yeah. make sense, but it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't make sense. <laughs> oh, God. Personally, I think you're a little canuts. <laughs> <laughs> now that makes sense. But we're also both a little canuts. Well... We wouldn't be doing this if we weren't. Touche. (laughs) 
like going on about how the amazing Mr. Crouch can speak over 200 languages, including troll, which makes Fred tease him. I mean, anybody can speak troll. All you have to do is point and grunt. <laughs> you and I have spoken <laughs> troll before. <laughs> 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 Next episode, fully done in troll. <laughs> oh my god, I will get the rehash written so fast for that. <laughs> Chapter 8, the Quidditch World Cup. The only difference in this one is they say prevent them using versus prevent them from using some of their best moves. This is a reference to obviously what's going on in the Quidditch World Cup. The Bulgarian players were preventing Ireland from using their best moves. And our favorite moments. And I mean, seriously, was Lucius just hanging out on that landing waiting to see the Weasleys? I mean, dude, he's just standing there like, not a Weasley. 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 Oh, Weasley. (laughs) Fuck. It's my time. Activate scorn. (laughs) (laughs) It's like they took the book, burned random pages, (laughs) and then just threw the rest of them up in the air. Right. As though Quentin Tarantino had directed this film. (laughs) Nope. Newell. Newell. (laughs) And they all fly towards the Irish and send them scattering. Because, again, that's what you do when you've got booming Bulgarian music and booming Bulgarian dudes on Bowling for Irish. (laughs) Yes. Exactly. The camera focuses on Victor Crumb. And what the fuck is he doing on his broom? Broomnastics? Like, is he trying to be like fucking Tony Hawk on his broom? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so like we were saying, kind of similar to the book. Somewhat, sure. In that a voice was magically magnified and then welcomed everyone to the 402nd final of the Quidditch World Cup. Even though in the book, it was Bagman. Mike Newell don't care what's in the book. Fuck the book. Fuck Ludo Bagman. In the movie, it's fudge. And Harry uses his omnioculars to watch as the Vila change into basically birds with like really creepy wings and can throw fire. I mean, talk about killing a boner. (laughs) That's why you don't go for looks alone, Harry. Yep. Just saying. And now on to chapter nine, the dark mark. There again are no differences. So on to our favorite moments. Fred and George were doing sort of an Irish jig as they pretend to play their Irish flags like flutes in celebration of Ireland's win. Which was fun. If not, kind of stereotypical. If yeah. I'm being honest. But if you can't do a jig and play a flag like a flute at the Quidditch World Cup, when can you? I feel like they should have been named the O'Weasleys. <laughs> The McWeasleys? The McWeasleys. <laughs> <laughs> they got the red hair. They're clearly Irish supporters. True. They should have been, like, officially Irish. Yeah. Just really drive it in there with some stereotypes. <laughs> and damn, that Weasley twin must be double-jointed, because his arms go so far back when he flaps. I'm not sure which one it is, though. Remember? Say it with confidence. It, it was, was definitely, definitely Fred. Fred. Okay. okay. It, it was, was definitely, definitely George. George! Oh, never mind. It was one of the twins. <laughs> it was one of them. Mr. Crouch assures him that she will be punished, causing Winky to become very afraid. He tells her that she has disobeyed him, and that means clothes. And we know from Chamber of Secrets that clothes mean she's getting fired. She's getting fired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just realized that Dobby got socked. <laughs> uh, two books too late, right? <laughs> Harry also asks about the people in masks, wondering if they are his too. And Mr. Weasley nods, saying, Death Eaters. What do they do? They eat death. Demise consumers. Deceased devourers. Murder munchers. <laughs> murder munchers that's exactly what i'm calling them from now on like forever now murder munchers murder munchers i think we just found the episode title too (laughs) nice now on to chapter 10 mayhem at the ministry 
matron versus nurse, how the books refer to Madame Pomfrey. The UK oh, yeah. version says matron, which honestly sounds a little rude to me. Why do you think matron versus nurse? You said you think that's rude. I don't know. I think mainly because like in America, if someone is described as matronly, it's usually not a it's compliment. Their, yeah, it's their homely or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Okay. I guess I get that. Also, traveling versus lost. The description of the Weasley's grandfather clock. And pointing at versus pointing to, also describing how the hands look on the grandfather clock. Sorting them into two versus sorting them into two piles, what Mrs. Weasley does with Harry and Ron's laundry to pack. I wish somebody would do my laundry for me. <laughs> you need a Mrs. Weasley. I do. So anyway, here are our favorite moments from chapter 10. But they could have easily incorporated the murder munchers actually fucking with muggles instead of just setting shit on fire. True. It would have actually been a little bit more magical to have them levitating muggles. Right, yeah. It's also more fucked up. Exactly. We wanted it to be more fucked up. I know. Come on. <laughs> this is the fucked up book. Why are things not more fucked up? I mean, they are fucked up in the movie, but just in different ways. <laughs> yes. New <Newell. laughs> <laughs> but this is a rainy day and everyone's occupied indoors with one thing or another and fred and george are in the corner quietly whispering over a piece of parchment mrs weasley is very suspicious of the twins and asks what they're doing i mean i feel like suspicious of the twins is just a constant thing for molly no <laughs> like no matter what the twins are doing you're suspicious of them <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's the norm. Yeah. <laughs> it's when you're not suspicious of them that you should be worried. Right. So there's that. <laughs> and now chapter 11 aboard the Hogwarts Express. There are no differences. Here's some of our top moments. And I mean, after everything Mr. Weasley said about the Quidditch World Cup Stadium, you would think that Ron wouldn't be that dense, too. I mean, literally, they were able to put charms on a giant stadium and campsite. Multiple can sites, according to the book. Yeah. Why, is it that hard to believe they could do it around a castle, too? Right? The fact that you're able to turn the inside of a tent into, like, a three-story grand palace and shit, and yet you think you can't hide a castle? Magic. Like, bam, magic. But this is one of the scenes that kind of references Harry's tendency to do embarrassing things around Cho, like how he sloshed water all down his front when he tried waving back to her at the campsite. Yeah, Harry uses the trolley cart to hide his awkward boner as the only Asian student in the whole of Hogwarts abruptly awakens his sexuality. <laughs> it just makes me imagine Harry awkwardly sidestepping with the trolley all the way down the hall <laughs> to keep his boner hidden. <laughs> I mean, the trolley witch offers Harry something sweet, but the only sweet thing he wants is dead ass. Cho ching! Cho ching! <laughs> Chapter 12 The Tri Wizard Tournament. This no differences is becoming a total theme. We expected this to happen, though. The more Americans became enamored with British slang, the less they felt the need to change as the books went on. So they're becoming less and less Americanized. And it's going to be really interesting to see how few changes there are as we keep going. But we will always have our favorite moments. Which I also did not mention earlier, but many of our patrons helped us find those as well. So they are literally our favorite moments. And here they are. And Harry says that he's starving and hopes the sorting ceremony goes quickly as he empties his shoes of water. Ew. Can you just imagine that walking squish, 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 I hate, squish. I hate squidgy feet. Oh my gosh, it's the worst. I hate squidgy feet so much. But also, why does he have to like empty his shoe out physically? Can't he just do a drying spell on his feet? He hasn't learned that yet. Ugh. Can he have Hermione do a drying spell on his feet? That is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Ron tells her that she won't help them by starving herself, and she tells him that the food was made with slave labor, refusing to eat another bite. I get that point, but she's already been eating it for this long. Right? 
I mean, good with your principles there, but yeah. not very practical. But also, there are no vending machines at Hogwarts. There should be. <gasps> How would you pay for them? Well, they have money. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Galleons and shit. <laughs> He begins eating a sausage after he sniffs it to make sure it's safe, I'm sure. I mean, I always sniff my sausages. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not cutting that out. You're all welcome for that. We get more of that intense Bulgarian theme as they grunt and bang sticks on the ground in a show of toxic masculinity. Especially since in the book... Not only were they not introduced at this point, but also they weren't in all boys school. Girls can study the dark arts and grunt while banging sticks on the ground, too. <laughs> I agree. Wasn't there boys in Bobatons as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what the fuck? Hagrid is so mesmerized by the large woman that he stabs Flitwick in the hand with a fork. Because apparently he's done cooking. Really? It must have been his time. Oh my God. Fuck off. <laughs> Wow. Flitwick becomes quite angry and is a bit of a dick to Hagrid for a simple mistake. I'm pretty sure there's a rule in place at Hogwarts that says you aren't allowed to fork the other teachers. Wow. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. So if Hagrid would have used a spoon, it would have been okay? I would think so. Spooning's pretty innocent. It can lead to forking, though. It can lead to forking. It can indeed. As long as nobody's doing any knifing, it's probably okay. <laughs> Chapter 13, Mad-Eye Mooney. Let's continue the theme, shall we? No changes. Here are our favorites. After potions with Professor Snape, divination is Harry's least favorite subject, since Professor Trelawney is always predicting his death. I mean, chances are at some point she'll be right. I mean, that could be true for anybody, though. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's why it was funny. <laughs> yeah. Was it, though? <laughs> we laughed, didn't we? <laughs> Because Ron is awesome at sarcasm. Right. Harry is sassy. Ron is sarcastic. Harry is sassy. Ron is sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> Seamus and Dean laugh at this. Ron's comment, not mine. <laughs> Didn't he go to Hogwarts? I don't think he did. He called it dear old Hogwarts, so I always assumed that he had. I mean, I thought he went to Durmstrang. It's not like you have to go to a school to become headmaster there. Well, no, but... Harry Potter Wiki says that he was possibly a Durmstrang student, but nowhere else does it mention it. See, I looked into it too, and Harry Potter Wiki also says he was possibly a Hogwarts student. Oh, Lord. <laughs> we could always just pick one and declare it with confidence. Oh, good idea. So definitely Hogwarts. Durmstrang. <sighs> How about we just compromise and combine the names? Okay. Durmstrang. Chapter 14, The Unforgivable Curses. Still no changes. <laughs> so let's just enjoy our favorite moments. And it was a tough job for the ministry to sort out who was being controlled and who was acting of their own accord. Again, similar in the movie. I, I've never had to say it this much in one episode. I don't know what to do. I know. I love it. No. no! <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the only time you'll hear us say that in that tone of voice. We'll see. <laughs> there could be some other moments. I'm not going to hold my breath, but yes, maybe. <laughs> he just removes a second spider from the jar and places it on the desk. At this point, he does use Engorgio to make it larger so they can get the full fucked up effect. Nope. Full trauma in the movie. Fuck everybody up. You get a therapist and you get a therapist and you get a therapist. <laughs> everybody gets 20 years of therapy. Except Snape. Fuck you, Snape. Well, yeah. <laughs> no therapy for you. No therapy, despite the fact he's probably the one who needs it the absolute most. Oh, yeah, for sure. Chapter 15, Bobatons and Durmstrang. Hey, look, we have a difference. On excellent form versus in excellent form. Prepositions. This is Dumbledore's response to Madame Maxime saying that she hopes she finds him well. So here are our favorite moments. Well, you know, he was expecting the seventh years and he was expecting the older kids. But probably once you get to the 11 year olds, he was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Scaring the shit out of them. And <laughs> right. <laughs> why is that one crying? Child, why are you crying? There's no crying in defense against the dark arts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we'll see how much you're crying when I crucio you. Yeah. 
Something like that. Harry makes it through the castle and reaches the cold and drafty room and finds Hedwig nestled between two other owls. He makes his way clumsily over to her where she proceeds to show him her tail feathers, still upset about his lack of gratitude from the previous night. Because <laughs> Hedwig's got some shade on her. <laughs> right? <laughs> Dude. Fuck you. That's very much like the owl version of Kiss My Ass. Right? Literally. <laughs> Everyone is surprised when Moody tells him that he will be putting the Imperious Curse on all of them so they can see its power. I mean, of course they're surprised. That didn't happen in the movie at all. <laughs> they didn't see it coming. <laughs> but it's not illegal to poison a student, probably, if you have the antidote right there. I mean... I'm sure it's frowned upon. <laughs> but you know, it's a potion teacher like Snape, I mean, he's very competent at potions. You know he has the real antidote right there. He's not going to let the kid die. I mean, do we know that? We probably know that. But do the 14-year-olds that have been tortured by the man for the last four years know I that? I mean, it's a terrible motivator, but it motivates. <laughs> <laughs> that's a sure way for me to die, is all I know. Because that's a sure way for me to be overly freaked out oh, you about know what Neville's I'm doing. potion's not gonna work exactly That's but Snape's not gonna let him die he might be a dick but he's not gonna straight up murder a student one would like to hope that he wouldn't murder a student sure. I don't think he would do that right under Dumbledore's nose he's not stupid he's a dick but he's not stupid <laughs> also though single malt whiskey for the horses right I mean, do they get, like, a trough of the stuff? <laughs> Is it, like, a feed bucket that hooks up to them and they drink out of it? Or do they have, like, horsey shot glasses? Or do they prefer it on the rocks? You've thought way too much about this. Whiskey for horses is weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty whiskey. <laughs> you made a pun. I love it. Sometimes I give in to your dark side. <laughs> Stay for a while. <laughs> Chapter 16, The Goblet of Fire. Look, more differences. Puddings versus desserts. During the feast, welcoming the guests and announcing the Tri-Wizard Tournament, the second course has a selection of unfamiliar ones. At weekends versus on weekends. The Golden Trio were not the only ones to get up early on Saturday because most people breakfast later at weekends in the UK version versus on weekends in the US version. But they were all excited about seeing who enters the tournament. What's she like versus what is it with her? Of course it's Ron wondering what's wrong with Hermione when she's obsessing over a spew and wants to ask Hagrid to join. Max, I wanna ask you about that one. What's she like? In America, when we say that, it could be in reference to her personality. It could be in reference to what she literally likes. But when we say what is it with her, we're commenting on she just did something crazy. Yeah, it's the same thing here. If you said, oh, what's she like? It'd just be like that. No one would assume you were going, for example, what is it with her? Which is exactly how it comes across. <laughs> yeah. It seems like an interesting change, but I do think in this one, the American version gets that point off a little bit clearer that Ron is like, girl's crazy. <laughs> I don't know why she's on about all this spew stuff. I think that it fits Ron's personality better to say, what is it with her? Because he's always like, you're annoying as hell. Like, yeah, I think it fits exactly. better. Exactly. In the UK, it wouldn't be too uncommon for someone to say what's with her rather than what is it with her or what's she like. If someone had come across as particularly aggravated or irritated in the day, you'd say, oh, what's with her or what's with him or what's with them? But in this context, it's like they haven't quite decided which one it is. Yeah, which tone they were going for. Mm. Again, I think that Rowling is just showing her eyes with it. Could be different slang, yeah. Different times. Back in my day. <laughs> <laughs> now hold on tight because here are our favorite moments from chapter 16. The movie still had him in that impeccable suit. So. Yeah, and I've said it before and I'm sure I'll say it again, but I've really missed the aspect of wizarding robes and them being unable to figure out how to dress like muggles. You have really brought me around to that mm -hmm. thinking. It never bothered me as much, but now that you're the one who's been like, why don't they do this? I'm like, oh, why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? <laughs> you're right. I love hearing you say that. <laughs> <laughs> 
actually, if they could let Harry, Ron, and Hermione, I would say if the together, trio could enter, sure. If they could do it as a team, they got that on lockdown. Hell yeah, they do. If you add their ages together, they're over seventeen too. There's that. I feel like that should count for something. <laughs> I mean, maybe they should have just all dressed in a trench coat, <laughs> sat on each other's shoulders yes. in a trench coat, and put their names in the goblet. Nobody Fire. would suspect a thing. Nothing ever. Harry, Ron, Hermione, just one name. No, it's Haranmini. Haran. <laughs> Haranmini. <laughs> Haranmini. Haranmini. This is also the first time the movie mentions the age line, even though the book actually had Dumbledore tell the students he was going to draw it. He was like, I'm doing this myself, <laughs> so I know you can't dupe it. Right. And Fred and George are like, we're going to dupe it. <laughs> <laughs> Do they dupe it? They don't dupe it. They don't dupe they it. They don't dupe it. <laughs> somehow it completely escapes their perception that there's a giant woman right present somehow they forget the giant woman okay yeah until ron notices out the window that hagrid has met up with the giant woman and is walking up to the castle with her and her students wearing an expression very similar to the one he had when he looked at his baby dragon norbert that just makes me imagine Hagrid looking at Madame Maxime like, Mommy. I was going <laughs> to say, yeah. Oh, look, she knows her mummy. She knows her mummy. <laughs> Which is weird. Come to mummy. <laughs> oh, come to mummy. That's awkward. He speaks of the vessel of victory and points at the cloth, which magically sends it flying off, revealing a large and ornate silver and glass chalice that emits a blue light. And vessel of victory is some excellent alliteration. Vessel of Victory. It's apparently Albus Alliteration Hour. Vessel of Victory. Tumbler of Triumph. Ooh, the Cup of Conquest. Mug of Mastery. Beaker of Beating. Tankard of Trouncing. Ooh, Goblet of Gains. Can of Kickass. The... Uh, I, I can't beat Can of Kickass. You win. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just keep rolling. Now we come to chapter 17, The Four Champions. And of course, there's not a single difference in this chapter either. And so here are some of our favorite moments. I mean, that sounds just exactly like what happened in the movie, I thought. The movie streamlines this part and just has Dumbledore, Karkaroff, Crouch, McGonagall, Moody, and Snape meander down the steps, nice and calm. Dumbledore gets to Harry and puts a reassuring hand on his shoulder, asking if Harry put his name in the Goblet of Fire super calmly. Just like in the book. Not different at all. Super chill. Because that's Dumbledore. He just hit the gillyweed. He's just a super chill guy. When Harry says he didn't, Dumbledore totally believes him and drops the subject. Oh, fucking wait. Psych! None of that happens. Everyone loses their shit and tries to blame the 14-year-old for showing up their magic skills. Did you put your name in the goblet of fire? Did you put your name in the goblet of fire? Did you put your name in the goblet of fire? Harry, did you put your name in the goblet of fire? Fire! 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 <laughs> what were you saying? That three words or less? Trigger a fandom in three words or less. Yeah. He said calmly. Boom. There it is. Also, if you want to do one word, did you put your name in the goblet of fire? That is one word. That is one fucking word. I love all of the memes about it. I love the the cartoons where he's like <laughs> doing all of these acrobats and then, <laughs> flouncing and, and then like shoves him into the wall. <laughs> fire! Fire! In the movie, Dumbledore looks troubled. Karkaroff accuses Moody of thinking, and Moody reminds him that he knows his shit and adds in that this commie fuck knows exactly what he means by that. <laughs> Karkaroff sneers and Dumbledore gets between them and tells them it's time to put their dicks away and actually try to be useful. You're paraphrasing, right? I thought those were direct quotes. I mean, was I watching a different movie? Apparently. I don't know. He then points his wand at his head and pulls out some shiny brain jizz from his temple. <laughs> you tell me what it is. That's shiny brain jizz if I've ever seen it. And chapter 18, The Weighing of the Wands. Once again, absolutely zero differences so we'll just move on to some of our favorite moments that's such a teenage thing to think well why would you injure yourself in something that's gonna murder right. you you'll be sorry when i'm dead pretty much you'll believe me when i'm gone i'm gonna hold my breath until you believe me <laughs> <laughs> 
Pretty much. It's Harry Potter and the Goblet of Hormones. <laughs> the Goblet of Puberty. Honestly, that's kind of the next book. <laughs> well, yes, that is true. Caps Lock Harry and whatnot. Just still all the nopes. <laughs> but Hagrid says that he looks like they're having fun and Harry's just like, you got to meet the Scroots. Because <laughs> my classmates don't look like they're having fun. More than one of them are being dragged behind a Scroot that just blasted off. And that just sounds so terrible. It really does. Like, I want to see it. It sounds so terrible. I want to see it. <laughs> they got the sentiment very similar. They just did it, you know, without Bagman. And I'm still mad about that because mm-hmm. where the fuck is James Corden? I know I love John Barrowman, but I, I would love James Corden too. It would have been great. It would have been great. It would have been great. Yeah. Hmm. Boo. I had to say it in triplicate. <laughs> But Ollivander seems pretty smart, yeah. and he doesn't say anything. So he just spends a little bit longer examining Harry's wand, then makes a fountain of wine pour from it, and returns it to Harry, declaring it to be in perfect condition. And Harry's just like, wait, what was that spell again? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I got to teach it to Seamus. <laughs> right? <laughs> and we are going to cut here. We will continue on with the differences in our favorite moments next week. Moving on to our Potter Ponderings. What are some of your favorite moments covering the first half of Goblet of Fire, either from our podcast or from the book and film in general? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. This will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Crystal Knight. She writes... I was already 18. I grew up in a very strict home and my mother believed Harry Potter was witchcraft and therefore a sin. So she never let me read the books or watch the movies. Then when I turned 18, I moved out of my mom's house and in with my, at the time, boyfriend, now husband, and told him that I had never watched Harry Potter because my mom wouldn't let me. And he sent our kids to the grandparents' house and we had a full HP marathon that weekend. I've been obsessed ever since. I haven't read the books, but that's only because I have memory loss and I forget things very easily. The only way I can read books is if I read aloud and I'm extremely shy, so I hate reading aloud and refuse to do it. I'm trying to remember to listen to the books be read on YouTube now, and I'm currently listening to the first book be read aloud. So fingers crossed it works for me. I can't believe I first watched the movies seven years ago now. I love me some Harry Potter. Thank you so much for sharing your Sorting Hat story with us, Crystal. That is a damn good husband. It's accurate. I especially love the part where he sent the kids away so you could do this properly. And I will add, no matter how you came into the fandom, you are a fan, even if you only watch the movies, even if you only read the books. And I am going to piggyback on that because... Yes, Carly. I'm actually jealous of people who have yet to read the books. Like, I wish I could have the magic of reading the books for the first time again. Yeah. Like, it was just yeah. the most magical experience ever, and I'll never get that back. Absolutely. Ever. I agree with that. I'd just like to say that it's one of the best things, I think, in the Fantastic Beast mm-hmm. films. It's one of the best things we get to see is the judgment of witchcraft and images of witchcraft in the first film. And we see the judgment of everyone in the area on those people who are just so unwilling to enter into this idea of, I don't know, acceptance towards stuff they don't understand. And I think that's a really good thing we see in in the new films. I agree with that. Yeah. And in general, we have tried to make this group as open and accepting as possible. And you've done a damn good job. Aw, thank you. Obviously, it makes the most sense to have read the books and watched the movies if you're listening to us, since we are specifically comparing the both. But part of the reason why we go into such a detailed description and summary is because I know that some people can't. So we're doing it for you. It wasn't until I started listening to the podcast that I read the books again for the first time since I was young. You did your first read? Well, young <laughs> well no i finished reading them when i was i don't know when the last when the last book came out to 2008 yeah yeah i think so that's when i finished reading them then i read them again throughout 
my teenage years, but then read them one final time when I uh, started university. And then I found the podcast and I read them all again and it shines a different light because I'd never thought about the movies and the books. I'd never thought of them as, as two things that could come together. <laughs> I, nev- I never mixed them. It was like mixing drinks. It was just not something you did. <laughs> 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 <So>. <laughs> well, we do that here. We mix those drinks. <laughs> a little bit off topic but again thank you so much for sharing your sorting hat story with us crystal yes thank you and if any of you other keepers out there listening would like ellen and katie to read your sorting hat story on a future episode you can email it to them at just keep rolling at gmail.com let them know your house wand patronus how you got into harry potter and anything else you might want to share with them or you can just message it to us over social media This week's trivia question is, and yes, Carly, Sarah, Max, Jackson, and Quincy are disqualified from answering this question. (laughs) In the U.S. version, Hagrid serves the Golden Trio cookies with their tea. What do they say he served them in the U.K. version? The first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag doughy will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. Make sure to check out our website at justkeeprolling.com, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to help us continue creating more content, you can support us as a patron and get extra perks on patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, Katie and Spirit, and thank you so, so much to Max and Carly and Quincy and Sarah and Jackson. We would not have been able to pull off this episode without you, and we appreciate you so much. This is Jackson Miller signing off. Bye, everyone. Okay, bye. This is the support badger, Carly Ferguson, signing off. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to tune in next week. Yes, join us next week when we talk about the second half of the differences between the UK and the US versions of the book and more of our favorite moments discussing Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just just keep keep rolling. rolling.